go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all the many joys that you have given us, for friends that come to visit, for a family that continues to be there for us, um, for all the wonderful healings that you've offered to our friends and our family, for all the safety that you've given us in our travels, for all the, the good experiences that we have in this world. We thank you, oh God. And we lift up the many that are on our hearts and on our minds that are not having those good experiences right now. We lift up those that are still struggling in hospitals. We lift up those who are still grieving the loss of loved ones. We lift up those who are getting ready to have surgeries. We lift up those who are still looking for answers. But mostly, God, in this space, we lift up those who are still searching for you. We lift them up in hopes that we can be your hands and your feet to this world and help them get to know you. And God, in those moments when the words don't come to even us, we instead thank you for the gift of the prayer you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That kingdom come, that will be done, on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The song that we just sang said, I love thee because thou first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. It was Christ who laid down his life for us, and it was his willingness and love to do so which we celebrate as we gather at this table and at this time. So let us come and remember him. Let's pray together. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we come before you this morning giving thanks. Thanks for all the blessings you give to each and every one of us and help us to be mindful of those blessings. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you watch over our church and our pastor and our souls that come here each Sunday. Dear Heavenly Father, we would like to see these pews be filled more, but we know that you are in charge and you will take care of it. We ask that you lead God and direct us this week, that you hear our prayers, and that it's in your will you answer them. Lord, we ask these things in your son's most precious name. Amen. And so we remember the night when Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. He took a loaf of bread, which they had been eating on, and he began to say a blessing of thanksgiving over it, and give it to each of his disciples, and this represents my body, broken for you. Eat of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And in the same way, following the meal, he took a cup. He offered a blessing of thanksgiving over the cup. He began to pour its contents into each of his disciples' cups. He said, this represents my blood, poured out for forgiveness for each of your sins. We're going to give it all of you in remembrance of my sacrifice. It's not going to be very long before we need some more um, crackers. <laughs> Just a heads up for whoever takes care of that. I'm looking at you, Pat, because you're the only one daughter. Not because I'm blaming you. Okay, we are in the book of Exodus still. Chapter 16. So to put us in place, last week we got the Israelites out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, and into the wilderness. So that's where we are this week. So we're in chapter 16. We're going to start at verse 2, just because that's where I want to start. We're page 112 if you're in your few Bibles. I don't know where we are in your personal Bibles, but Exodus comes after Genesis. Chapter 16 after 15. All right, here we go. Verse 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died at the Lord's hand in Egypt. There, at least, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. 
In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other day. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites in the evening, You will know that it, is, it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumblings against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumblings against him. Uh, who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Okay. There's a story about a man who goes to the same diner every day for lunch and orders the same meal. Have you heard anyone like that? Know anybody like that? So he goes and he orders the same meal in the same same place every day. And the new manager starts and he comes around and he asks him, in, Sir, how was your meal today? You know, as they do. And the gentleman said, Oh, it was good, but you know, I could use some more bread with my meal. So the next day when the manager saw him come in, he says to the waiter, I'll give you two pieces of bread today. So he does, and he goes over afterwards, and the manager says, How was your meal today, sir? Oh, it was good, but I could use some more bread. So the next day he comes in, and the manager says to the waiter, Give him three pieces of bread. So again, he eats his food, has his meal. The manager comes over, How was your meal today? Oh, it was good, but you know, I could use some more bread. Next day, same thing, four pieces of bread. It was good, but you know, I could use some more bread. So the manager is determined he's going to make this customer happy. He's going to make him satisfied. So the next day, he bakes a special loaf of bread just for this particular diner. He creates it a foot long, fresh out of the oven, beautiful as you can imagine, sits it on the plate right by the guy to enjoy. The guy eats everything, every bit on his plate, the entire loaf of bread. He is rubbing his belly and having a good old post-lunch kind of glow to him. The manager comes over, how was your meal today, sir? Oh, it was good as usual, but I see we've only gone back to the one piece of bread. <laughs> Our lesson for today comes from the book of Exodus, and it begins like this. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, at least there we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But no, you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. It's comforting to know, I suppose, 3,000 years ago, Moses had to deal with the grumblers and complainers just like we do today. The story of a pastor who goes to visit a woman who is homebound, and there he listens to her drone on and on and on about every complaint you can imagine. Her neighbors are too loud, and the people from church never visit, and her arthritis has gotten worse, and the weather is terrible, and on and on and on and on she goes. And then finally she says, but you know, pastor, I've had the worst headache all week long, but suddenly, in talking to you, it has gone away. To which the pastor replies, I know where it went. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we pastors are not the only persons who have to put up with complainers. I've always felt sorry for football coaches. They have to put up with an amazing amount of grumbling from the alumni, the boosters, the journalists, even the average man on the street. Sports fans are notoriously grumblers. Married people, mm -hmm. also about a bunch of complaining, don't they? Sometimes. Anyway, one man had inscribed on his wife's tombstone these words, Here lies my wife in earthly mold, who when she lived did not but scold. Good friends, go softly in your walking, lest she should wake up and rise up talking. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, women have no quarter on the complaint market, fellas. Uh, I dare say that if a survey were to show at least as many grouchy, grumbling men as there are women, many of you would say a lot more, but I'm not going there. Moses had to put up with a whole nation of complainers. The Bible says the people were murmuring. That was the word that they used. You know what murmuring means, right? Have you ever heard people murmuring? Nothing kills an excitement or a movement faster 
and murmuring. <laughs> the ironic thing is, often it is people who have the least to complain about who are the worst murmurers. Oh, goodness, are they? There is something about having much that makes us feel we deserve more. True, the children of Israel were out of the wilderness, but at least they were free. They'd been slaves all that time. At least they were headed toward a new homeland and a promise. They got to see all these great things. I saw the Pharaoh's heart finally released. And still, they grumbled. What has God done for us today? I mean, it's great that he got us through the Red Sea, but today's a new day, right? Should it start over? I've known people like that, haven't you? I have been people like that on occasion, I must confess. What hope is there for us murmurers? Is there any cure for complainers? Good. I do say there is, and it begins, first of all, with, those, with the help would come if we confess our pettiness. We don't like to think that we're petty, but alas, we are. Many of us simply do not have the grounds for murmuring. We have been blessed far beyond what we could possibly ever deserve. There's a story about Captain Eddie Rickenbiker, uh, who was a pilot in World War I and a Medal of Honor recipient. With 26 aerial victories, he was America's most successful fighter pirate, pilot in the terrible war. He also received the most awards for valor. Eddie Rickenbacker <coughs> excuse me, uh, was once asked what the biggest lesson he learned after a crash at sea left him drifting with his companions in a life raft for 21 days he was left. Uh, he says the biggest lesson I learned, he said, was that if you have all the fresh water you want to drink and all the food you need to eat, you ought never complain about anything. I think many of us can fit in those categories, correct? Many of us know that. Deep in our hearts, we are aware of all the good fortune. Intellectually, intellectually, we know that there are millions of persons who would gladly trade places with us. A mother has taught us this little line, I cried because I have no shoes until I met a man with no feet. Right? You've heard that expression. We look at our lives and all that we have. We know that every day we ought to offer a testimony of thanksgiving to God. But still, we complain. Still, we murmur. This is not to say that things always go our way. But I'm always reminded of the Peanuts cartoon, you know, Charlie Brown and Lucy, and they have the ball team that always loses. And Charlie Brown is complaining about the fact that they always lose. To which Lucy says, you know, you learn more in defeat than you do in victories. He says, then I should be the smartest man on earth. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm tired of learning from my mistakes. I want to learn from doing things right for once. Life is filled with frustrations and aggravations and trials and tribulations. Life has many downers. We would not try to minimize that fact. I don't think that's what I'm after. Sometimes, however, we need to step back and put our lives into perspective. We need to count our many blessings, you know, like the song says. We need to confess our pettiness. We also need to acknowledge God's provisions for us. The greatness of God is shown in his response to the people's murmurings in our story for today. Sometimes when our children seem ungrateful, we respond defensively, right? We're angered by their attitude. We want them to see and appreciate all that we have done for them. Something boils up in us when they shrug off all of our sacrifices and all the things that we've done for them. The human response is a lack of gratitude, right? How dare they not appreciate all that we have done for them? But that's not God's response, right? God heard the people murmuring and he responded graciously, as he always does. In the face of their grumbling, God provides for their needs. He provides manna from heaven. They gathered the manna each morning, and when it dried in the sun, they had a sticky, solid food which was edible and nutritious. He also provided quail for them. Every spring, we are told, flocks of birds cross the Red Sea on their way to the Sinai Peninsula, where they land exhausted near the coast and are easily caught. It's exactly what the Bible describes, God's provision of meat in the wilderness for their wanderings. God also provided water. Scholars tell us that many of the forest rocks in the desert contain water. 
God led Moses to such rock, uh, and Moses struck the rock and outpoured water adequate enough for the whole host of people. Every last one of those murmurers. God heard the murmuring of the people and provided for their needs. I think that's interesting. Of course, just so you know, he would have provided for their needs without the murmuring if you ever wanted to give it up for something. For God is a giving God. If you cannot see that, you'll probably never change your outlook on life. You will never have the gratitude attitude, as they say. I am certain that there are cynics among the Hebrews who sought to offer <clears throat> rational explanation for the quail and the manna and the water and the water, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God has placed us in a world full of cynics and yet calls us to see the world through the eyes of faith. Right? There's a story, uh, a legend, a myth perhaps, of the great Scotsman Robert the Bruce, who was the king of Scots at one point. Uh, but he's running away from people and he's trying to get ahead of England to set up their, their countenance. And, and he ends up into a cave. You know, he's going to hide in a cave for a little while. And he watches in this dark cave as a spider continues to build a web right over the mouth of the cave. And he just kind of watches this kind of determined spider take over. And so by the time the enemies come, the whole cave is covered with this web. And they think, huh, well, it can't be in there because there wouldn't be a web, right? So they continue on in their way. Now, of course, anybody who's ever cleaned knows that spider webs come back just as quickly as you knock them down. But in that time, that wasn't something they thought of. So away they went. And the story, the legend, the myth, as it was, says that he immediately hit his knees and thanked God for that little bitty spider doing what that little bitty spider does. Now, was the spider building a web in front of his hiding place as a coincidence? or a divine providence? Did the spider simply happen along to build a web, or was it guided by divine impulse? Each of us must decide for himself or herself how we view life. When you have had a bad accident and walked away unscathed, did you say, thank God? Or did you say, boy, I was lucky this time? Life is a matter of interpretation. For the person who sees the gracious hand of God at work is in far less danger of becoming a complainer than the cynic is who sees only random chance and no plan or purpose. Now, I am going to take a little moment to burst a little bubble to say that doesn't mean you're never going to be a complainer if you see God as a hands of everything, but you're far less likely. That is what I actually said. A cure for complaining will begin with a confession of our pettiness and an acknowledgement of God's provision. But there's also a little extra little piece, and it's probably the most difficult of the prescription, so to speak, to get rid of our chronic complainers amongst us. Complainers uh, inevitably, invariably, center on themselves, not upon God so, or his goodness, not upon uh, their neighbors in need, uh, but upon themselves. So, what do you do? Focus on God and your neighbors. You can complain a lot less if you're busy doing those kinds of things, right? It is that we discover God's purpose for our lives. That's the most important cure for complaining. God's purpose for our lives is that we what? Serve others. I'm going to say that again. God's purpose for our lives is that we serve others. Does that mean that I serve myself? Does it mean that you serve yourself? That's not what it says. It's not what we're saying. I think about uh, Dr. Carl, Carl Menninger's famous prescription to a lady who was depressed. Was that she go out and find someone who needed her help and help that person. It's also the best prescription for chronic complainers. Complainers are invariably centered on themselves and not upon God uh, and his goodness. Not upon our neighbors and their needs, but upon themselves. The Hebrew knew, the Hebrews knew themselves to be chosen people. They knew that, right? The Exodus experience confirmed it. You don't go through something like that and not know that you were picked for a higher purpose, right? They were God's own people, a holy race. What they sometimes forgot, though, was that they were chosen for a purpose. They weren't just chosen to get through the Red Sea and that be it. They were chosen to be a witness for God to other nations and to their continued nations. Israel was God's own beloved. 
God brought them out of Egypt not to live a life of privilege, but one of purpose. Not to be served, but to serve. We who are the new Israel have that same summons. There's a story about English poet George Herbert who would gather amongst some friends each night and they would play music together. They had like a little small orchestra. It was their stress relief, their time together. They would gather together and play. And one night he was out on the road and get, going to his friend's house and he saw a guy whose cart got stuck in a muddy ditch. So being the kind-hearted man that he was, he goes over to help get this guy out. Oh, he's covered in muck and mud, and, and it, you know, he's, he's late getting to the place, and he's just, he's looking harried and crazy, and he immediately starts apologizing for his tardiness and for the way he looks and, and for all those things to which his friend very clear, clearly says, well, you missed the music. Sorry about your love, but you missed the music, to which George responds, that's all right, because I'll have songs at midnight. People don't complain when they have songs at midnight. People don't grumble as much when gratefully and joyfully they give their lives to serving God and other people. Guess what? This is one of those sermons that when you walk out of here and you say anything, I'll know if you're listening. I can't always say that, but this one I can tell you, I will know if you're listening to the sermon today. My hope, my prayer, my purpose in sharing today is that hopefully you were listening this day. Amen. Our uh, hymn of discipleship will be hymn number 455. We're going to sing the second verse. While you're getting there, I want to say these words to you. It goes along with how I kind of ended my sermon. Someone once said that the most dangerous place to complain is on the front steps of the church. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of reasons for that. Um, I would like to overhear some conversations as you leave this place today. We can find out very quickly, like I said, if you were listening to the sermon. Are you a complainer, a grumbler, a murmurer? Uh, isn't it time you confess to your pettiness? Uh, for you have so much with which to give thanks. Isn't it time when you acknowledge God's bounteous provision? Isn't it time that you quit thinking about yourself and be considered the purpose for which you were called and created? So let us think about those things as we join in singing the second verse of You Have Called Me. <laughs> children of Israel murmured just as you and I sometimes do. <clears throat> but God provided for their needs just as he provides for our needs. God was at work in their lives, and God is at work in our lives. Why, then, are we murmuring? Why are we complaining? Isn't it time we say thank you instead? Isn't it time we began sharing those blessings with others? So let us leave this place and share as we have been called to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. 